And that was a joke the other day I heard at the bar was, if you haven't turned your ACL, torn your ACL in Summit County, are you a real local? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to stay not a local as long as possible. I, I recommend that. <laughs>
yeah. system for the end of the season. Yeah. And so I came in third place for third overall points. So huge, huge end of the, to the season. Yeah. Um, it was my second season snowboard racing. Um, okay. Yeah, there was six or seven upper limb guys. Everything was going great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I had this season ending. Yeah. So then you were injury. basically <laughs> on pause and definitely had to reorient what you were doing and reorient your training a lot. Um, you went to a great orthopedic surgeon in the county, uh, Tom Hackett, um, uh -huh. who we both know, and he's amazing. Uh, and that all went well. And we'll probably talk about some of the attributes, I think, that uh, Dr. Hackett has that makes him just such an excellent orthopedist, not only from the technical standpoint, but also, I mean, he's really well-renowned for his bedside manner and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, now, what are some of the things that helped you come back as an athlete? Because I know that we're going to have athletes that are probably in your similar situation, the situation that you came back from listening to this podcast. And what kind of stuff do you wish that you knew back then now? Uh, well, like we talked about in our little coffee meeting, I think a lot of it came from my military background. Yeah. Um, getting the job done, knowing what's happening. And it goes back to, and like you said, we'll talk about it with, with Dr. Hackett, is mm -hmm. that he laid out the whole plan. It wasn't, hey, you're going to get ACL surgery. I'll see you in six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I knew exactly what I was getting into with him mm -hmm. with as far as what he was going to do for the surgery, what it was going to do for me, and then how long I was going to be out for and what are the expectations. It's like, you're going to be out for six months. You're going to miss this season. It yeah. is what it is. You're, and I think that was really good. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> from my, obviously my previous injury, I had, this was going to be a, piece of cake <laughs> in comparison. Um, yeah. And it came back to a lot of, I focused on the goals and the baby steps mm -hmm. that came with healing and getting back to being fully active kind and of, 100% again. Yeah, so kind of process oriented, right? Yeah, first you get the ACL done and everyone thinks that's the end of the end of the, end of the line. Oh. And it's, and if, now that I've mentioned I've tore my ACL again, I've just, yes. I'm on three, week three of recovery. Yeah. Um, doing great. To me, that's that's where it starts. It's that's the beginning. Your ACL's oh your ACL's healed. It's done. You just have to heal the rest of your knee. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, and that's the way I thought about it the first time. It was like my ACL's fixed. Mm -hmm. It just needs time, and I need to take baby steps and get the rest of my leg where it needs to be mm -hmm. to make sure that ACL can do what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Um, and that's where that's where I focused was ACL. I got the surgery. Boom. That's done. Biggest issues done. Mm -hmm. Let's get that out of the way. And now it's all right. I got two weeks of crutches and some some knee work with a CPM machine. Mm -hmm. Let's get that done. Boom! I'm off crutches. Awesome. Goal met. Mm -hmm. Now it's time. I didn't. And then at that time, I didn't know how strenuous the PT was going to be. Yeah. And how hard it was going to be. Oh my god. Yeah. But then again, there was baby steps to that. It was mm -hmm. all right. Now you can do the stationary bike. Awesome. Now that alleviates. That was a like a moral high for me. Mm -hmm. so, all right, now I can go to the rec center and I can get 20 minutes on the bike instead of doing wall slides in my bedroom for yeah. 15 minutes four times a day. Um, so that was huge. Yeah. And then it was like, all right, now you can do body movement, which was great for me because the season before, I spent all summer doing calisthenics and CrossFit. Mm -hmm. I was in a strength and conditioning program for six weeks. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was, all right, this is the next step. Now I can do... I can do squats, body squats to a bench. Yeah. I can do lightweight work, upper body. And it was just, that was just how it just kept rolling. Mm -hmm. It was just those baby steps. Yeah. And I love the, the idea, that framework of breaking down this very big goal, which was obviously to make the Olympic team, which is a big audacious goal, you know, and breaking it down to those individual pieces. And uh, in some of our discussions before we sat down, we talked about some of your background, you know, growing up in sports, military background, uh, different things like how did you foster and cultivate all of this self-efficacy, uh, your feeling of uh, that you can get things done. And something that you mentioned earlier was well, military was a big, big thing in that. So taking those big audacious goals and breaking them down into individual pieces then you don't have to make the Olympic team the week after your surgery, you know, because yeah, no. there's no way. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. You know, and being process oriented. So what kind of things, 
uh, you know, helped you out with the military training or some of your uh, previous uh, sporting events and things like that? Like what, what made that happen? Because I wish that we could just bottle up self-efficacy and force feed <laughs> it to everybody who gets a surgery, right? That'd be great. But uh, unfortunately, you can't do you that. You can't do that. Um, yeah, a lot of it was the military, um, former Marine. Mm-hmm. There, isn't, there isn't a quit. There isn't a not get the job done in the yeah. Marine Corps. It's you're, here's your mission. You're going to get it done. Mm-hmm. And you do. And, it, and then that's it. Like, there's no like, yeah, we did it. No, and now, now there's another mission. And there's another mission. And there's... In the, in the back in the garrison, back in the states, and then there's deployment. So it's ever changing. It's always rolling, and mm-hmm. I think I brought a lot of that into my uh, athletic training and the way I approach snowboarding. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd only learned to snowboard six months after I got injured. I'd only snowboarded. I only snowboarded twice before I got injured. No way. Yeah, we're kindred spirits with uh, <laughs> being in Summit County and starting. Uh, Snow sports kind of late in life. Yeah. So I got injured in 2012 in July. I was cleared to do activity in September. And then I signed up for Ski Spectacular in Breckenridge. Ski Spectacular. It was the first place I went. Um was my first leaving Walter Reed experience. And I flew up. We flew out here. There was probably 20 vets uh-huh. with a bunch of uh, PTs and OTs and some doctors. And I was exposed to this adaptive world uh-huh. all at once. And it was awesome. And I... Wow. I learned how to snowboard the right way. Yeah. Um, I had been to Big Bear three days mm-hmm. before I got injured. 2007 and then twice in 2011. Yeah. Um, and I learned how to snowboard, and I guess I did really well, but I attribute that to my skateboarding and surfing background. Mm-hmm. It's just another board. Yeah. Um, did really well with that, and so I got invited back, and then the whole story got into the into the racing world. But, um, yeah, going back, I used the military – aspect to you break down the goals you break down your mission we mm-hmm. have a we have a five system method of getting a mission done mm-hmm. and that's kind of how i approached my injury and then i approached it in the snowboard world with everything comes in small steps like i've said mm-hmm. you gotta and there's always there's the big picture but to get there you have to do everything else in a row yeah and that's so i attribute a lot of it to my military background Going by all those steps, not skipping steps, not going ahead. Yeah. There's a big, big goal. And -hmm. then within those are a bunch of tiny goals. Yeah. Um, And I say that's how you're supposed to do it anyways, from what I understand. So (laughs) I don't think I did it wrong. Uh, I don't think so either, obviously. (laughs) Obviously. uh, Because you did make the Olympic team uh, and you did did. well. Yeah. And well, that was my other goal was, so there's the national team, which Uh is every year they announce the U.S. national para snowboard team. Mm -hmm. Um, And that... And it was, it's great because they help pay for registration. They help pay for flights. Mm-hmm. But for me, I wanted to just go to the Paralympics. And I knew that you could be do well and go to the Paralympics and not make the national team, not be on the national mm-hmm. team. So I think that was huge for me in transitioning. Hey, I don't need to make the national team. That's more stress every season for no reason in my mind. It was do my best, get as much training, as much time on snow as I could, mm-hmm. and do the absolute best I could at every race. And I did what I did, and that's and that next time I just have to do better. Mm-hmm. So I think that was a huge prioritizing. You got to figure out what your ultimate goal is. Yeah, and that's what I did, and it was to go to the Paralympics, no matter how I got there. And I didn't really care how I placed either. Mm-hmm. Once I was on the team, that was my goal. I was already I'd won, <laughs> honestly. I mean, and I did 14th in in uh, Bank Slalom, and I did 15th in Border Cross nice. out of I think 23 or 24 upper limb guys. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that was huge for my mental health. Yeah. Not, I mean, cause you're so stressed and everyone's so worried about how they're going to do and what they're going to look like. Mm-hmm. I was a 35 year old dude trying to go to the Paralympics. I didn't really care. Yeah. It was, uh, I made the team and I mm-hmm. went and that was my goal. I love that piece of don't lose the forest to the trees mm-hmm. where, you know, if we had, you know, all of these other like minor things that we devote all of our mental energy and, and physical energy to like making the national team and then just prioritizing saying, look, the big goal is making the Olympic team and then going to the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't need to expend all of this energy to this unnecessary task of, for me, making the national team. Yeah. So I love that idea of prioritization with your goals as well. Um, so yeah. Um, 
How you doing, Z? Oh, I'm still here. <laughs> You're checking on me. Yeah. <laughs> Big stretch. Um, so uh, next thing, you all obviously had a really good support system throughout this whole process, right? Mm-hmm. Um, ranging from your family to coaches, PTs, et cetera. What were some of the big things associated with that that really helped you get back? Oh, man. Um, yeah, there was a lot of them. My wife was huge. Um, she knew what the goal was. And, I mean, she, we moved out here together yeah. to chase my goal to be on the Paralympic snowboard team. Um, so she was huge at helping me day to day, knowing my limits, telling me when I should calm down or take it easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, the coaches were great. Um, Dr. Hackett was great. I'm sure we'll get into the doctor side, but, um, yeah, yeah, the coaches, um, I think a big thing for me was they, I communicated what my limitations were. I Mm -hmm. think that's, that's huge. You have to tell coaches and I think coaches too need to tell their athletes, Hey, like you need to shut it down today. Mm -hmm. There's this drive to be the best and to get the gold. And, and I know from life experience, you end up hurting yourself more if you push yourself, um, there's no reason to go hard every day for three months and then you're burnt out by the time the season starts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the coaches knowing what my limitations were, talking with the coaches, telling them what my PTs were telling me, mm-hmm. what, what the PAs and the doctors were telling me. Um, and I would even say go so far as if an athlete is hurt, have those coaches go to those meetings, go to those follow-ups. Yeah. I, I, I think they're doing it now nowadays. Mm-hmm. I would hope so. <laughs> have those coaches go to those, to those follow-ups, yeah. go to the PT sessions and, and really watch what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to see, and I know it's hard, but I would like to see more coaches be that more involved, especially if you invest that much time with an athlete, oh, yeah. go be that support for that athlete. Um, I love the idea of interdisciplinary communication. It's key. Um, such a, such a huge thing is uh, working all together for the most important thing, which is the athlete and the athlete's performance. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that takes uh, getting rid of some of the ego uh, from both sides. Yep. Um, because you know the coach has to be able to listen to and change what they're doing potentially, depending on what the provider is saying. Yeah. And then the provider's got to talk about some of the limitations so far, and you know if there are any setbacks with anything, uh, they've got to just have open communication with those mm-hmm. in order to help the athlete excel. Yeah, I think that's that's imperative, especially now with the way things have since, since my injury and now learning what I, now I'm a ski patroller now and I have my mm-hmm. EMT basic, but learning that much more about concussion protocol. Oh yeah. And, and how injuries, there needs to be steps and there needs to be time. Um, not just physically, but mentally. Yeah. I think it was another one for me was, Hey, you need to take, take some time off. And we kind of developed this program at adaptive action sports was we didn't, we didn't go to the mountain and train on Fridays because mm-hmm. it was crowded. And it, it blocks your mental. If you're if you're worried about being hit or hitting somebody or it's just, yeah. just a lot going on, we wouldn't train on Fridays. So yeah. that was another, not part of the knee thing, but that for me, it was the coaches being in tune with the athlete. Mm-hmm. I think mental health is just more important than physical health. Oh, when, sure. when you're rehabilitating an injury, mm-hmm. you need to focus on the mental too. It, the coaches know what they can do physically, but you may not know that athlete mentally until something. Yeah. To me, as minor as an ACL – but to them, that could be their first injury ever, and it's just demoralizing and just ruins their whole career, yeah. per se. How did you keep yourself out of that demoralized state, out of that state? Because I know we've all been there. I mean, I've been injured before and gone down that downward spiral of rumination and catastrophization and yeah. things like that. Uh, how do you keep yourself out of that? Or if you see yourself spiraling a little bit, I know that you do a lot of mental work. You, you meditate, you work out, do all those things. How do you bounce back from that? How do you turn that spiral the opposite direction? Yeah, um, it's finding new stuff to do, which for me was was huge. It keeps keeps my brain moving. Um, mm-hmm. Ask my wife; I can't really sit still. Um, I try to sit on the couch every now and then and watch a movie, and I, I make it like halfway through, and I ah, I gotta go outside. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was like riding a stationary bike to heal the knee. That was something new. At least I was getting up. I was moving. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, refocusing your energy somewhere else that helps you to get your mind off of going down that spiral. Small victories. Small victories. Um, yeah, learn 
for me, it was learning new exercises that I'd never done before because I couldn't put weight on my leg for three or four weeks. Yeah. So now I was like, I was learning how to do a bunch of seated exercises, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. But then I thought too, it's like, okay, now I'm doing seated. Now that's helping my core. Yeah. So I'm still, I'm still getting better. Mm -hmm. I'm still doing something to better myself. And then while healing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's key. I think you need to realize that like, yeah, your knee or your shoulder is busted, but you can do all these other things outside of your normal routine that will help you not just mentally, but could be beneficial to you physically. And you're getting better. You're getting stronger. And I, one thing I hope that people listening to this, you know, key into with how you talk and how you shift your mindsets uh, because I think that those mindset shifts are so important in getting that continual progress saying, Oh, well, I can work on my core, you know, even when I can be, when I can't weight bear on my leg, Oh, I'm going to sit in the CPM machine, but maybe I'll meditate, work on my mental game, things like that. Mm -hmm. Now regarding uh, your new injury, <laughs> what, uh, what things are you thinking about doing differently this time around? I mean, you obviously had a, a, sex, a successful rehabilitation from your first injury. What things are you going to improve upon for this second uh, comeback story, if you will? Um, I've been reading a lot more. <laughs> I didn't read a whole lot the first time around, and I think that's good for me mentally. Like mm -hmm. I keep saying, I know for me, mental health is huge. Yeah. Um, no, I would like to – I haven't got that far, actually. I'm still <laughs> um, – I'm waiting to get off the crutches. Uh, that's going to be a huge goal. Um, but I, I think I'm going to probably keep it the same. Mm -hmm. It worked the first time. Yeah. I don't, I don't like the reinvent the wheel attitude. Yeah. I think if something works and uh -huh. I know me, um, but I am going to focus a lot on, uh, cardio and core this time. Whereas last time I was trying to, I was worried about my knee. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of bike riding to strengthen my knee. I did a lot of, um, body workouts, squats, mm -hmm a lot more leg stuff. And I think this time around, I'm going to focus more on o overall body. Yeah. Um, core cardio. I think this is the time I might have to do a part two, you know, definitely. Yeah. I mean, once you're back. Yeah. <laughs> um, now kind of third aspect in this, um, sort of triad of support or things that we like to talk about on this podcast, um, is the, the private provider. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not necessarily a provider yourself, but, you obviously had a great orthopedic surgeon. You had great PTs uh, helping you through the rehabilitation and recovery process. What are some of the things that, I mean, obviously Dr. Hackett is a, an artful, like very, very highly esteemed surgeon, uh, surgeon for the U.S. ski team mm -hmm. and para ski teams, et cetera. Uh, what are some of the other things that set him apart in your opinion? Oh, uh, he, I feel like he asks the more important questions. And I mean, well, he's, He's a surgeon of the athletes, mm -hmm. the, the national elite athletes. So he knows, he knows what athletes go through. He knows athletes' recovery times. He knows what the, the end goal. Everyone wants to get on on snow or back back at it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. But I I feel like he was the best at communicating. Again, hey, these are the expectations. This is the reality. Mm -hmm. You're going to need to abide by this. But I'm also going to cater it to help you be successful. Mm -hmm. um, so he second time around. <laughs> Hey, how's it going again? <laughs> yeah. Not the way I wanted to say hi. Yeah. Uh, but he, I, I told him, I told him my backstory about, well, he asked me about last time and I was like, yeah, I made the Paralympic team. I went to South Korea and he thought that was great. His face lit up. It was awesome. Yeah. Because I always wanted to tell him thanks, but I never got around to driving to Vail. It's way too far. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, he talked about that. And then I told him, hey, I'm getting back into racing again after a hiatus. And he was like, all right, awesome. So we talked about the different procedures of what we could do, um, how we could help me be successful as quick as I can, but as healthy as I could. Yes. So I think that was great. He mm -hmm. communicated and he's just, he knows, like I said, he knows athletes. He knows what the end goal is and he caters the healing process and the surgeries around that. And your return to snow was um, pretty fast, right? After the after the first one, eh, yeah, I mean, okay, so yeah, I guess so. Uh, they, <laughs> I was told six to eight months, uh -huh. and I was back on snow exactly six and a half, mm -hmm. and I was cleared. I didn't just go <laughs> willy. I didn't go rogue. Part of that communication piece, uh, I was cleared by by two PTs mm -hmm. um, that are, were now my friends. Um, yeah. I got invited to poker games and went mountain biking with them. Nice. Um, so yeah, I was did that part, and I yeah, I, I got a 
a basin powder day in yeah. May of 2017. Did you call him up and say, hey, it's a powder day. I can't come to PT or... You know? <laughs> uh, I was done with PT by then. Okay, okay. I, I, shoot, I had finished it like I think four or five months and I was doing stuff on my own at that point. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, uh, so six, six and a half, six and a half months, which I guess was fast. Um, but then again, talk about what, what, what I knew about my body and my limitations. I took three runs and I called it. Yeah. I was like, there's no reason I'm back. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to re-injure this bad boy. Yeah. Even though I didn't think I would, there's that odd chance that I get hit by somebody or mm-hmm. I snag a tree. It was May. It was variable conditions <laughs> yeah. were existing. Um, and it was seven inches on top of no snow for like two or three weeks. So um, stayed on the groomers, got some powder runs in, and then yeah. I went home. And that's a, that's a crucial component, I think, with uh, return to play, return to sport is – Let's celebrate some small wins, you know, Mm. something like, so I come from a running background and, you know, back in the day I used to run like a hundred miles a week, you know? Mm. And so for me, like going for a run was a 75 minute run. Right. Yeah. (laughs) If I did that now, then I'd have to crawl home, you know? (laughs) Uh, So for me now, a run might be 10, 15 minutes. Mm. And for you coming back from that initial injury, where you used to be able to snowboard all day uh, doing, you know, specific training for racing, et cetera. That first day back on snow was three runs on groomers, taking it easy, right? Yeah. Oh, it was great. I was elated. Yeah. I was pumped. I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. Part of no, that process. had no problem. I didn't feel any pain. I, I didn't go crazy, but I was, I was making turns and I was in the powder and got done and went and had a beer up at the bar and then went home. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, so that's one more thing, just circling back to the small victories, being a part of that process. Because mm-hmm. you knew that was probably one of your only days of snowboarding that year. That was that was the only day I got. Yeah. <laughs> that whole season, yep. And then it went right into getting ready for the next season. Yeah. So, And then what were some of the things that you did at the start of that next season? Were you just back to full force initially? Or what was that return to snow? What did that return to snow process look like in that next season? Um, that, so that summer was, a was a, catered a little different. I had already set up a routine for the summer. Um, typically take a May, a month off, take May off mm-hmm. season ends like March or April. I would take May off. I would eat whatever I wanted. I would drink a bunch of beer, not do anything. Some yeah. couch, just mentally, just take it easy. Um, do what I wanted to do. And then June would start up and I would get into strength and conditioning mm-hmm. straight into, I would go back to eating right. Quit drinking beer on the quit drinking alcohol on the weekdays, um, and try to get all that muscle mass back from the winter. Because mm-hmm. if people that don't know, when as a winter athlete, you gain a bunch of muscle mass and you get in shape, and then you kind of just stop because you're full bore in race mode and you skill training, skill training, and you'll you'll lose you'll lose muscle mass, you lose mm-hmm. ten to 12, 15 pounds, maybe not that much, but you you lose muscle mass and you lose you drop weight because you're traveling and you're racing all the time and you're burning calories. Um, yeah. So my, and I got taught by a great coach, Adriana at the CrossFit gym. Hey, let's build your muscle mass back up. And then you train cardio on all that new muscle, which mm-hmm. was like, Whoa, this is mind blowing. This makes, yeah. this makes so much sense. Instead of trying to get your cardio up and then you gain a bunch of muscle mass. And now you have to restart your cardio again. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would do six weeks of strength and conditioning, get strong, eat right. And then I would go into six to eight weeks of, of like plyo, mm-hmm. box jumps, body calisthenics, do all that while skateboarding and mountain biking. And then the last six weeks before race season started, it was all calisthenics, cardio, main, maintenance mm-hmm. um, at that point to get ready for the season. But uh, with the injury, <laughs> uh, I had to kind of tweak. I, I skipped the strength and conditioning. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to overload my knee. I didn't want to do anything to, to stress it, to, to make it spaz out. So I went into a lot of, I just did a lot of uh, plyo and body, body work. Nice. Lightweight. I mean, I don't think I got underneath a, a barbell until July. And that was a year, almost a year after I got mm-hmm. injured. Not even a year for my, to, since my surgery. Uh-huh. So I had to refocus. Wasn't, so, wasn't worried so much about gaining weight and putting on mass. I wanted to get get my legs strong again mm-hmm. by building mu- muscle mass the right way and 
working on my cardio because I'd lost a bunch of cardio. I, I could feel it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just not doing anything for the injury, and it's, sitting on the it's couch. <laughs> easy to feel it when you're living at 9,000 feet, you know? Definitely. It only, it only takes two weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I had to – I developed a new plan. I did a bunch of cardio, a bunch of plyo, mm -hmm. and then I – I did my strength training later on. Um, you kind of flipped the script I kind of there. flipped it, yeah. yeah. Get the last six weeks in. Wasn't so much worried about cardio at that point. I was just trying to get a little bit of strength back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that's kind of where I'm at now with this summer. Um, I can't wait to get off the crutches, and I can't wait to get back to just doing body squats, and calisthenics, and just a bunch of plyo. And I actually love the fact that you took that month off. Um, you know, the rest, not only for the physical health, but for the mental health as well. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, okay, I'm, I'm not eating, drinking, living, snowboarding right now. I'm yeah. a, just being a human being. Uh -huh. um, that's something I never really did when yeah. I was a runner. And that the amount of burnout that I would feel, um, you know, just the, the intertwining of the psychological system with the physiological system. And if you feel that burnout mentally, it's going to affect you physically. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. And um, I love the, some of these uh, key aspects that we touched on a lot, the, the mental side of things, because mm -hmm. it's so key and so crucial for the physical rehabilitation. Um, and a lot of the mental things that you learned while in the Marine Corps are a lot of the things that helped you excel mm -hmm. when you came back from the first, and undoubtedly, they're going to help you come back from the second injury, too. Yeah. And I've even, I've even carried that over into my job as a patroller now. Yeah. Um, season ends in April. Copper usually closes the last week of April. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take all of May off mm -hmm. and just kind of do nothing. I get the house switched over from winter to summer. I get the backyard set up. I get the garage cleaned out. I clean a bunch of stuff. I get ready for camping season. Um, and that's corn, great for me. Get the cornhole bags out. Get the cornhole bags out. Start doing the doing the yard, and then um, I'll I'll slowly work into my summer jobs mm -hmm. around June. I work at a fly shop, and then I work at a brewery. So I usually take all of May off, and then I'll work two day two three days a week at those jobs, and then I quit those jobs in September, the next shoulder season when stuff starts to slow down. Kids are back mm -hmm. in school. People aren't coming up as much, and I'll take September and October off work wise and get ready for the next season, mm -hmm. get all the summer stuff stored, break out all the snowboards and the skis and get everything ready for winter, put the, put the car, put the ski racks on the, on the cars. Yep. Um, oh, still while doing some workout stuff, but I'm not going as hard as I would in like June, July, August. And then that's another mental break to, to, to relax before mm -hmm. I go back to now back to work. But then it was full bore into once November hit, it was full bore race season until yeah. You tore your ACL. We talked about all of the things that helped you in your recovery and helped you make the team again. And now tell us about that experience of being at the Olympics um, and, you know, coming back from all those obstacles and then being there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll see. Pro the ACL, had the surgery, missed that entire race season, which was I was I was depressed. I did. I did, I did get in a hole. But come out of it, I had to. There's no reason to get depressed. I couldn't, I couldn't go race. Mm -hmm. My next focus was getting back into shape that next summer, like I talked about, and then going back. And that, that was the season. That was the, that was the last season. 17-18 was the season. The Olympics and the Paralympics were in March of 2018. And I started in October of 2017 to go race again. I was ready to go. Um I think a lot of it was those baby steps. I made a lot of goals, and I felt good mentally. Um, I was strong in my knee. I was ready to race. Um, and I just had that. I still had that goal. I just need to make the Paralympic team. I need. I just need to go and get enough points to be considered to go to the team. Um, and there was a lot of stress because I found out later that, or during that time, that they don't always take the same number of people. Um, so there's, dis there's three dis disciplines and then there's male and female. So there's um, the LL1, LL2, which is both lower limb um, categories. And then there's an upper limb category. So they don't know if they take six up, six lower limb guys, there's not a whole lot of room left. I think they had a cap on the total number of male and female athletes oh, they could take. Okay. 
I'm not sure how it really works. Yeah, I think it changes every year. Um, but found out that they're going to take three upper limb males, and there was exactly three of us on the U.S. in the, in the U.S. total that were competing. So for me, I took that as okay. I'm in. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not in. I still got to put in the work. Yeah. I still got to do the job and, and try to get on the podium every time. Obviously, that's the goal. Mm-hmm. But I knew if I did my best and just gave it everything I got every race and got points, I was gonna get. I was gonna go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had doubts. Like every my first race, I didn't do well. Um, it's yeah. Bank Slalom. It's in Landgraf. I mean, the place sucks. Sorry, it's we, it's the it's the meat locker. Yeah, it's a giant indoor ski resort with a hotel attached to it. Mm-hmm. You never see the sunshine except for in your room, and it's the Netherlands. It's like gloomy. It's like Europe in the medieval times, um, and you're in this ice box that's like eight degrees all the time. Yeah, and there's like neon lights. Just not a good. But it's the first race every year. Um, so I didn't do do I didn't do well, but I didn't do terrible. I didn't come in last. Um, and then. Went right into Canada, and that's a huge one. It was a bank slalom and a border cross. And I ended up, I walked away with eighth place in border cross, and it was huge. I was like, get top ten? Yeah, let's go. Let's do this. Um, so I just, like I like we talked, I just take small victories. A um, little bit of chop away at it a little bit at a time. Um, had some really good results in Italy and France that year. Um, and just kind of kept chomping at the bit. Just, all right, as long as I do well, and my goal was to make top ten, is produces the most points mm-hmm. is all I really do had to do was get points. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have to get podiums. I realized at least I don't think I, I didn't, I knew I wasn't going to get the podium anyways. There's some really strong riders. Yeah. Um, and going back, I'd only been snowboarding for four years. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not like some of these, some of these guys have been snowboarding since they were eight and yeah. lost, lost an arm or a hand and then kept going. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. And I also had struggles. Like, like I said, I, I would get down on myself because I wasn't the fastest. I would look back and like, why did I, why did I speed check before that hit? Why did I speed mm-hmm. check in turn three? Mm-hmm. Um, but I just kept thinking, just do better, keep going. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, I remember. Uh, I guess was it? Did we go back to Big White. We went back to Big White. Was it World Champs? Went back to Big White. So Big White happens in the beginning of the season, like December. That, that year, every other year, every other season is a world championship race. They invite, you have to be invited, you have to have points. Um, and I, I was fortunate, I got invited. And I was like, okay, this is good because that means I have enough points to get invited here. That means I'm now on the docket to be able to go. Yeah. And I think maybe that's when I got eighth place. I don't recall. It was too long ago now. But um, went back to Big White at the end of the season. Um, I think it was two months or a month before the games, month and a half before the games. And um, I was definitely stressed. I had to do well. And I think I did do, I had, I had, a, I had a good performance. Um, again, it was a bank slalom and a border cross. Uh, and then I remember we have the, um, they have the dinner to announce every, all the, te- all the, have like a, the team event. They have the individual awards. So they had the team awards, the individual awards. We had a big dinner. Um, it's like a three course meal. They have open bar. Um, it's just like to wrap up the season. It's great. Nice. Um, and then I remember um, I found out that they, they made the announcement for the Paralympic team. At Big White. What did that feel at like? At the dinner. It, it was crazy. It was surreal. Uh, they threw out all the jerseys. We all got our, our race jerseys. Oh, and no So that's way. how they announced it. They were like, they were just like going around and like, hey, you made it. You're going. And I remember me and my buddy, Spivey, both got ours back to back. And I was like, we're going. Yeah. Let's do this. And it was, it was great. Put it on. I was all like, oh. We wore it around for like 20 minutes and I took it off. Um. No, and then it was, okay, cool, I made the team. I was like, oh, shit, now we got to go. Now I got to perform. Now I got to race three, four more times. Yeah. Um, but I think at that point, I'd already shifted. Like I, I, obviously, I, I care. I wanted to do the best I could. I wanted to, I wanted to win. Mm-hmm. Obviously, but I also knew that I wasn't going to podium. It, just the way it was. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, think, it's the Olympics. I think it's, yeah. and I think it's healthy to have, realistic expectations yeah if you're if you know if you if you've been podium the whole time yeah i'm probably gonna put him but i hadn't i hadn't podium since the year before i got hurt mm-hmm. so i knew i knew where i was in the lineup of of, of upper limb male snowboarder racers yeah. um but that didn't bother me i'd already met my goal i i got the i got the race jersey, the race bib the race jersey i was going so everything else just like i yeah. remember being so excited 
but this huge stress just like coming off of me because I didn't, I care, like I said, but like I didn't care. I was going. I was going to go represent my country again in the way that I wanted and I had met my goal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, get a little choked up. Sorry. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Thinking about it. Uh, um, no, and then, and then it was, yeah, let's get ready to go. And so training didn't stop. Came home from Canada. I think I took like a day or two off and then we were right back at Copper working on stuff. Yeah. Getting ready. And then, yeah, got the team together. We all met at, I think well, most of us met at Denver Airport and we all flew out, picked up a couple people. I think we flew to Philadelphia or New York. I forget. Um, no, we went the other way. We went to Seattle mm. and then flew that way. Um, but yeah, and then got there and then, yeah, getting getting to the Paralympics. So the Paralympics are held, if people don't know, they're held in the same spot as the Olympics. Aren't they just like a week after or something? It's a week, usually 7, 10, 12 days after. The okay. Olympics stop. There's a break. They get everything switched over. They get clean up all the rooms. So you stay in the exact same rooms as all the all the other able-bodied athletes. You eat in the exact same cafeteria as everyone else that was just there a week yeah. before you. Um, a lot of the venues are the same, but for us that year it was different. We didn't race on the able body uh, race courses. But you're you're there where the Olympians just were. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, and you're there with all all your teammates, and it's like a whole it's a whole process. So you, we flew in, we stayed overnight at a hotel. We got the next day, and it was like in processing. We had a whole day of in processing. We had to go and fill out a bunch of paperwork. We got we got uh, fitted for all of our opening and closing ceremony outfits by Ralph by, by Polo Ralph Lauren. Um, we got all the swag. We got a bunch of, we got Nike goggles, sunglasses. We got t-shirts. You get all your, you check all these, you get like a checklist and you got to go to like each little booth. You got to go to like the, yeah, it was crazy. And then that's like a whole day of that. And then you get your, you get your lanyard, you get your pins. Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother story about trading pins. I didn't know anything about that until I got there. You trade with like other countries? Other countries. You try to get as many pins as you can is like the game. So you go like barter and there's like high, high value like no one won't, no one traded with China. Um, <laughs> I got a story on those guys, uh, but uh, yeah. So then you then you get bust and you get your rooms and like you stay in there. Like I said, you stay in the rooms that the able body ski team was in or the able body yeah. hockey players were in. Um, so yeah, just a complete surreal experience. And you're getting fed three times a day. Awesome, awesome food. There was like mm -hmm. six stations, like international. There was a South Korean booth. There was a Chinese booth. There was like an American. There was an Italian setup, um, and you eat with all the other countries. Everyone always sits in their little tables together as a team. The, when the the pin trading happens, uh, yeah, it happens everywhere. They had a they had a like a building with um, video games and TVs and ping pong tables. It was like a rec center. Uh, they had massage chairs. They had quiet rooms you can go and be just quiet in. Um, yeah, we trade there. You trade at the cafeteria just in passing what's like a good number of i've, ne I've never heard about the pins thing uh, i mean you have to talk to a guy named keith gable i think he won i think he had 80 80 like he had them all over and like i think you had i remember like, we had like two we had two lanyards with like our name and our country and all that and i think he had two and he his second one was full up too i think i came away with like I, I it was a cool game but i was i wasn't like people were like going to other dorms like knocking on doors i was like I'm not doing that. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a cool game. Uh, but yeah, and then we had, I think it was like, so our event was like eight days out from when the games actually started. So like skiing started happening. Hockey was happening. Um, there's not a whole lot of para, para winter sports. But so yeah, we had a couple of days of just chilling in the village. And then we start, we would go and start train training. So then we had two days of training. And then we raced sport across one day. And then we had, I think it was a day off, and then we had two days of training for Bank Slalom, Bank Slalom race day. And then we, I think we left like four days later. Um, yeah, surreal. Yeah. Cool, cool experience. That's so cool. Yeah. Tell me about the ski patrol. How long have you been uh, ski patrolling for? Oh, man. Uh, so I just finished my fourth season. Nice. Um, yeah, I got done with, with snowboard racing, and I was like, oh, man, now I got to grow up and get a real job. <laughs> um, so I had... Looked into, I was like, I don't, I guess I'll just, um, I forget how it actually happened. I ended up, um, so ski patrol, they had to have avalanche mitigation mm -hmm. and they get to throw bombs to, to make sure the snow is okay. So my job in the Marine Corps was I was an explosive ordnance disposal technician. So I 
was EOD. I, I blew stuff up for a living. Yeah. Um, so that was like, okay, cool. Let's go do that. Um, when I was, at, I was already in school. I was at CMC. I was trying to get a geology degree. And that wasn't really working out because the way the class structure was. I, could, I couldn't take physics. Um, it was hard to get calculus knocked out. Um, and I noticed that they have an outdoor education um, ski area operations degree at Colorado oh, really? Mountain College. Yeah. And it's like nine courses. It's how to drive a snowcat. It's base area operations. It's trails. It's snowmaking. There's ski patrol. So I took ski patrol one mm-hmm. at CMC in Leadville <laughs> for a season. No way. And um, the instructor there had actually patrolled at Copper. And was like, if you're serious about this, you need to go work at Copper. And he's like, I was like, all right, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna apply next, I was gonna go apply next year. He's like, you need to do it now. They have tryouts in the spring. And I was like, oh, shit. So went online, found the application, applied, um, had did the tryouts, had an interview, got hired. And they're like, all right, now you need to go get your EMT. Enrolled in EMT that summer of 2018, <laughs> uh, three months after the Paralympics, yeah. and then uh, got hired on and went straight into ski patrolling. Started in 1819. That's awesome. Tossing bombs again. Uh, didn't toss as much as I wanted to the first season, but yeah. Now <laughs> now I am on the uh, I'm on the snow safety team, um, part of the avalanche mitigation team, route oh, leader, man. going out making sure this the terrain is safe for for public. That's awesome, and it's been great. Outside five days a week, yeah. snowboarding and skiing and throwing bombs. Um, yeah, pretty pretty surreal turnaround from doing four years of snowboard racing and then going into yeah into that job. So it, it all everything's just kind of flowed since I moved here. It's been it's been pretty great. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, except for the injuries. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've all got to have our own trials, right? Yeah. yeah. I just want to pick your brain as a ski patroller. You know, uh, me as a skier, you know, I want to know what can I do to prevent myself from getting hurt on the hill. And a lot of people doing their, you know, ski trip, ski vacation, or all the locals up here, um, we'd love to just mine your brain for how do we (laughs) not get injured on the hill? And what are some of the things you see consistently that lead to a lot of injuries on the hill? Oh, man. Yeah. Um, As ski patrollers. I mean, this is huge for us. I mean, we have I have great bosses and we have great teams to really harp on this every season. It's getting getting back back in shape. A lot of a lot of patrollers, we, we only work six months a year, mm-hmm. and when we are working, it's 120 days on snow. I mean, we're we're stacking up the, the days. Um, so for me, it it goes back to yeah, know your body, get back in shape, get some kind of routine in, um, get your body ready for that rigorous season because it's it's full bore. It's you're setting up the mountain for the first two, three months, depending on the snow. Mm-hmm. And then you're in a maintenance mode, which is just as equally hard and rigorous, if not frustrating. And then the last month and a half, you're in teardown mode, which you're going and you're pulling everything up that you put out all season. Mm-hmm. Um, and side note, it was a huge shock to me on how much goes into maintaining a mountain. I mean, as somebody that just goes five day, times a day, five times a year, yeah, doesn't see what it takes. Um, it was mind blowing how much we put into getting a mountain ready for people to go enjoy frozen snow, frozen water. Yeah. Um, so yeah, eating right, early season, getting your body ready, mentally get ready, get all your gear, get everything hashed out. Uh, for me, I like to be early. Mm-hmm. If I'm early, I'm ready to go. Um, I find when you're late, you rush, and when you rush, you mess up. Mm -hmm. Um, hydration, huge, got to stay hydrated. I learned from my training, especially up here in the mountains, um, you need half of your body weight in ounces a day. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you should probably be drinking hundred ounces a day. Um, and that's just helps your body function. Yeah. Helps you process your food, helps you mental clarity, all that. Um, and you guys do liquid IV too. You do electrolytes too. I drink electrolytes. Oh, yeah. uh, when I'm working, I take them every day. I take a packet every day. Yeah. Um, I try to get 80 to 90 ounces in me every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so that eating right, huge comes in because you're out there. I mean, we work we work 10 hour days, but I'm, I'm gone for 12, 13 hours a day. I get up at 6 a.m. I don't get home till almost six. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it was, yeah, hydration, eat right, get your body ready, get your mind ready. And then, 90% of what it is, I like to say, it's just maintenance. We have daily checks on, hey, maintenance, check in with your body, take those days off. 
you work five days in a row and you want to go play, maybe you shouldn't go to Steamboat on a powder day in the middle of January because it's probably not beneficial for you to go tax yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, So know your body. Um, Preventative maintenance. Do your, a lot of the, a lot of the older guys preach warm ups in the morning. They, these guys get up, they have a routine. They get up, drink a glass of water, get some water in you first thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Eat your breakfast, eat a good, healthy breakfast. And then I, I have a routine in the morning. I get up and I just do some like yoga and some light stretching and some squats. Mm-hmm. Get your body fired. Get the blood flowing. Um, that's huge. I see a lot of people come to the mountain and just go straight to the lift line. Not yeah. saying that's wrong, but there's that, like we talked about, that ego side. Oh, I've been snowboarding for nine years. I don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, you, fatigue's going to hit you at one point. Yeah. If you want to keep doing this in, into your 40s and 50s, because it is, it is so much fun. Mm-hmm. Um I'm going to throw in a Marine Corps. It would behoove you to <laughs> Marine Corps term there. It would behoove you to start doing something now um, to get your body ready for when yeah. you're in your thirties and you want to continue doing the sport that you love. Yeah. Um, we all, I mean, it happens every year. We see it. We get that January, February lull. Everyone's taxed. Everyone's burnt out mentally and physically. Mm-hmm. Um, time to reevaluate where you're at. Um, we started a new, a new program at, at copper uh, called team thrive. Every day we have a check-in on our phone on an app, mm-hmm. and it's green, yellow, orange, red, and you put where you are, and that goes into a database, and all the, the boss can see it and see where people are mentally. Okay. Um, we started along with Team Thrive is um, we see a lot of some pretty serious accidents at Copper and, and some deaths um, yeah. on serious um, injuries. Well, not just Copper, everywhere. Every, yeah, everywhere. But as patrollers. You, you can see serious injuries. Um, and when people don't quite make it out of those injuries, um, we have a system where they, it's the rule of three. Three days after the injury, three, day, three weeks and three months, there's check-ins. Mm-hmm. And they meet with everyone that was on that call, meets with two members of Copper that have had some training on how to deal with stress and PTSD. And mm-hmm. you just talk about how you're feeling and what happened and... Um, there's always an after action is that day. As soon as that injury or that death happened that day, there's an after action. Hey, what went right? What went wrong? Mm-hmm. What can we do to make this better? Um, so that's been key for the patrollers, yeah. the mental health side. Um, yeah, I think something, you know, people don't necessarily appreciate all of the different factors that go into being a ski patroller because you're not only very much taxed physically being outside, you know, it could be, minus 14 degrees and you guys are out, you know, making sure that the mountain is safe for everybody mm-hmm. and skiing all day. Everybody thinks, Oh, well they're just having fun, you know, just skiing yeah, all oh, day. Yeah. But there's, I mean, there is that part, but there, there's a ton of work that goes into that. You know, you guys are getting up and you're there a lot of times before the sun comes up and you're out making the, making sure that the mountain is safe with avalanche mitigation. So you're part bomb squad, part EMT, part first responder, <laughs> part professional skier slash snowboarder and all those things wrapped up into one job. And then you're also dealing with this emotional side of dealing with significant injuries, dealing with death that happens normally. Um, Cause uh, skiing is a dangerous sport. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was the, that's the joke. We're not just one. It's not one job. It's, it's three. Yeah. All rolled into all one. rolled into one guest service, <laughs> yeah, yeah, guest profession, service. <laughs> professional athlete. And then yeah. an EMT. Mm-hmm. you're a, a rolling EMT on snow while making sure people are having a, a good experience. Yeah. Do it all. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just got to maintain. <laughs> what are some of the things that you see a lot in like, uh, you know, the vacationers and the, in the, the people up here for their annual ski trip, uh, what are some things that they should avoid or maybe watch out for? Cause I know oftentimes, you know, uh, people know that they shouldn't drink while driving, but then you see a lot of intoxication on the, the hill and things like that. Um, can I have some remarks on those kinds of things? Yeah. Well, it might, it might seem obvious for, to us, but. And that's the, other, that's the other joke. It's like, people don't know, but it's like, yeah, living at 9,000 feet, I know that I have to drink a lot of water. I know that water and food are, are my lifeline to stay cognizant mm-hmm. of what's going just just to live. Yeah. Um, so, and that's the joke is you got people coming up from sea level that f- 
fly straight into Denver mm-hmm. and they try to come straight to the mountain until they try to go ski at two o'clock in the afternoon mm-hmm. and don't acclimate to, yeah. the, to the elevation. We see a lot of dehydration. I see a lot of altitude sickness. Mm-hmm. Um, get here for the viewers that are out of state, get here a day before you go ski or don't mm-hmm. ski your first day or snowboard your first day. Get here, drink a lot of water, um, get food in your system, eat a healthy breakfast. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the elevation and the oxygen, lack of oxygen up here are going to play a huge part in your ability to, well, I run 10 miles. Well, yeah, you live at three feet above sea level. Yeah. That's that's a piece of cake. I tried to run when I first moved up here, and it, I quit doing it because it was silly. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I didn't make it just to the to the end of the block. Um, and the, the decrease in, in partial pressure of oxygen is not a linear decrease. No. It's, <laughs> it's an exponential it's, curve. It's, so going from sea level to somewhere like Denver to going from Denver to eight or 9,000 feet yeah. is like the same metric. And wow. we're going up to, you know, we're living, we're right now in Silverthorne, which is about 9,000 feet. Mm-hmm. But when you get to the base of the mountain, we're talking 10, 11,000 feet. And then if you go up high to some high alpine territory, you're above tree line. You're yeah. above 12,000 feet. Three of our peaks are at 12,000. Exactly. Um, so that decline in partial pressure of oxygen is very significant. And it's, like I said, it's not linear. Uh, the, the higher up you go, the, there is an exponential decline in the amount of oxygen that's available to you. Yeah. It's funny because I get, we, we'll have like, well, when did you, you get to Colorado? I don't like to say when you get to the mountain because it starts, mm-hmm. a lot of it starts in Denver. Yeah. And I've had a lot of cases where it's like, well, I felt funny when we landed. And you decided to come straight up here and get in a pair of skis. Mm-hmm. Not saying it's bad, but you probably should listen to your body. Yeah. Um, so that's my that's my key point for people from out of state is and hydrate before you come. Hydration yeah. is not you're not going to chug a glass of water and be instantly hydrated. It takes mm-hmm. days. It takes a couple of days to get your body fully hydrated and ready for the elevation. And then the other side for the locals is I don't know how many responses I've had in the park. It, and it's we have we have two questions that we have to ask is, um, tell me what you tell me what happened. Mm-hmm. And then the next question is, um, how could this injury have been prevented? Ooh. And I, a lot of times I get not going as hard. Or I probably shouldn't have gone for that, for that 720. Mm-hmm. Or I probably should have had more speed. And it, back to injury prevention, it goes back to knowing your limits and knowing your body. Yeah. If you haven't been landing that, that, that 1440 all day, you probably should take a break that day and not try to get one more. Yeah. Um, know your limits. I mean, every, every park has the smart sign. Mm-hmm. But not everybody reads them. Um, so yeah, know yourself. Know what you can and cannot do. Know your capabilities. It's mm-hmm. huge, and 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 it's. I think it's part of this new. It goes back to ego, and everyone wants to be an X Games medalist and go to the Dude Tour and, and be the most badass person on on their YouTube and their Instagram. But you, you're going to be that person. You're going to be that person that's sitting on your couch for six months, not doing that, <laughs> and looking at those people that are doing it. Yeah, and getting that much more depressed and upset. So. Know your limits. Mm-hmm. We had a joke, um, and I heard I heard all of the mountain. It's uh, two more, skip the last. You don't. You never say last run. Yeah, um, and that's huge because the last run you want to get all the fun out of it. And that's oh, man. I've had a lot of response calls too, where that was their last run of the day, and now snowboarder who snowboards last run of the season now <laughs> six days a, uh, six days a season, and now has broken his collarbone. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> again, know your limits, um, and then we call it uh, the other. Other thing is, um, like you mentioned, alcohol. Mm-hmm. I know people are having fun. Alcohol is a great way to have fun if you're on the mountain. I think it's part of the culture a little bit, you know, at Price Ski, all that. But I get a lot of response calls too. It's usually about 2, 2.30 after the lunch break. Mm-hmm. People have had food, had a couple beers at the base. They go back up, they get brave, um, and then they get injured. Liquid courage. Liquid courage sets in, and now they've, they've broken their collarbone or yeah. broken – Bilateral wrists. I've had a bunch of those in the park from snowboarders mm-hmm. putting their hands out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no. Again, know your limits. I think that's. I'm gonna keep saying. I'll say that all day. Yeah. Know your limits. Hey, have your fun. Um, I took a lot of. Um, I take a lot of a lot of good ideas from other sports that I do. So I do. Um, there's a wake surf company, wake surf camps. Mm-hmm. Uh, start a wake for warriors. They provide wake surf experiences for wounded warriors, and wounded veterans. And um, they have a rule. You can have all the fun you want on the boat, but as soon as you crack a beer, you're no longer allowed to go wake surf. 
and I and I kind of took that to racing as well. I mean, everyone, I, I love a good beer after a good day of training. Mm-hmm. But if I if I train and I want to go in for lunch and I have a beer, I'm done. I'm done for that day. I'm yeah. not I'm not going to go back out. There's no reason. Yeah. Don't um, mix high velocity with high blood alcohol content. Ex- <laughs> it doesn't end well. <laughs> um, so that was that's another key thing I like to say is like, hey, maybe you probably should have been done. Mm-hmm. Or if you want to keep riding, only have one beer at lunch with food. Yeah. And then have a bunch of water. And then for those people who haven't been exposed to altitude and alcohol at the same time, alcohol does affect you differently at altitude. So where you might be able to, you know, have a few beers and then feel fine at sea level. If you're up at altitude, that same few beers might mess you up in a pretty different way. Yeah. That 4.3% Coors Light is going to, is going to feel like a six percenter up at 9,800 feet or 10,000 feet. I've seen plenty of that too. (laughs) I remember <laughs> we were coming out of the adaptive action sports office and I look up and there's like seven girls. It was spring break and they're all shotgun and beers. Oh. And I swear I saw one of those girls not four hours later going down in a toboggan. Oh my God. It's like, Oh, spring break. So I'll see you later. I'll see you at the clinic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was before my ski patrol days too. I was like, I already knew. I was like, all right, have fun with that. It was like, it was like eight 30 in the morning. Oh <laughs> Yeah. I was like, all right, I get it, but you're not going to have fun come two o'clock. Oh my gosh, yeah, those those I know I know everybody's on vacation, but it's like if you want to really like maximize your skiing and things like that, then you know, yeah, beer clock isn't eight thirty, you know. No, and I know, and I, and I always when we always say that too. It's like we forget that, like like I said, there's people that come out and they only ski for five days a season, mm-hmm. and they're coming from Tennessee or Nebraska or Florida. So they want to get it all in, but it's like, know your, know your limits. No. And back to the priorities, you know, if your priority is to ski those five days, Mm -hmm. then you've got to be doing your strengthening prep work beforehand. You've got to know your limits on the mountain, uh, limit the alcohol consumption because it's not only going to affect that day, but it's going to affect your recovery and your subsequent days. Mm -hmm. Nutrition, huge. Uh, And something we didn't talk about sleep. Sleep. Oh Yeah. Very huge. If you're going coming from sea level, going up to 9,000 feet, your sleep is going to be affected. You know, a lot of mm-hmm. people have trouble sleep, one, with travel. Number two, with preparation for travel. You know, those couple of days leading up to that trip might be pretty stressful. Um, but those couple of days before the trip, that's when you really need to cast that safety net and start banking a little bit of sleep, mm-hmm. getting as much sleep as you can because your sleep's going to be affected by the altitude, by the travel etc. And, oh, yeah. you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too sometimes, you know, you can't do five full days on the mountain yeah. and then go out on the town every single night as well. Yeah. I mean, I you can try, a lot. but you're going to, you're going to fail. And then maybe you're going to be meeting, meeting Jimmy on the mountain, you know, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> this program is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Always consult with your physician before starting any exercises or doing anything contained in this program. Always stop if you experience any pain, discomfort, or difficulties performing anything described in this program.